Good morning, everybody. Good morning, students. I'm gonna ask everybody to make, please make sure you're muted before we begin. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today, we are excited to offer our Professional Quest CFP Wealth Management Panel. We have some amazing panelists here, so please listen closely. Um, if you have any questions, please submit them through the chat feature and we will, um, we will get them to our, our wonderful faculty moderator. So I'm gonna turn it over right now to Professor Horsmeyer and he's gonna lead the panel. And um, thank you again for coming. Thank you, Carrie. Um, good to see everyone here. I think we have an interesting panel today, but I'll start off with um, introductions before we jump right into the questions. Um, the structure uh, today will be, you know, about 50 minutes to an hour long discussion. And please, again, you know, um, put your questions into chat. And then a few of our panelists will actually stay for breakout rooms. So if you have specific questions that you want to ask on kind of more of a one on one ses session um, or setting, please uh, hang around for that. Um, to begin, I am uh, Professor Derek Horstmeyer. I'm a professor in finance. I'm also the director of our new financial planning wealth management degree here. Uh, we've just kicked it off. We have about 50 students total in the program. And um, what we're going to learn today is kind of the life of a life and career path of a financial planner. Um, so with that, I guess I'll turn it over. We'll do um, brief introductions. I'll turn it over to uh, Ms. Ms. Sarah Baker. Figure out how to unmute here. Hi, good morning. I'm happy to be here. Sarah Baker. I am with the Mason Companies. So I've been a financial planner and in this business since 2004 and currently with Mason uh, located. Our headquarters is in Reston, Virginia. We're a large wealth management firm with an institutional division and a private wealth division with about a, a little bit over $10 billion under management. We do three main things on the private wealth side financial planning, which we'll talk about today, investment management, and then tax preparation. So looking forward to uh, the discussion today. Thank you, Derek. Um, thank you. I guess we'll go over to uh, Evan Beach. Good morning. Happy to be here. Uh, yeah, like Sarah, I, I work for a financial planning firm, also does investment management, does tax planning. I work for Campbell Wealth Management, a partner here and been in the profession since 2009, kind of fell backwards into it, graduated at a terrible time, but it's been uh, a true blessing for me. I mean, it's just been an, an amazing experience across the board, uh, across a few different firms. So happy to help, happy to answer any questions you all have. Uh, great, great. Um, next, we'll turn it over to um, Andrew Fincher. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Andrew Fincher. I work with VLP Financial Advisors. So I actually, uh, I'm probably the youngest panelist here. So I'm only 24. Um, I recently graduated from Virginia Tech's financial planning program. So I've been out here for about a year now working with VLP. Um, like the others, we do investment management and just general financial planning. Um, something different about us, we also have a 401k side of the business. So that's something we focus on a lot is corporate 401k accounts. We get to go out and talk to a lot of participants. Um, so if you have any questions about that, feel free to, to let me know. Great. Um, interesting um, angle there. Um, and uh, just to mention um, Andrew's uh, boss or maybe coworker, uh, Dan Lash is a huge supporter of our program. So um, always good to have VLP here. Um, last but not least, uh, Sid Sum. I'm going to butcher your last name, Su Ramanan. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, I got that close. Um, I'll turn it over to Sid. Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, Sid Subramaniam. Um, I graduated from George Mason in 2006 and was with a firm called Northwestern Mutual, which um, you know, I'm sure a fair amount of you have heard of. Um, and then now I'm with Mass Mutual. So my career path um, was primarily on the insurance side of things. So a lot of my clients are, are young. I work with a lot of physicians and dentists too. So disability insurance, things like life insurance were important to them at that time. But now they're getting older, starting to earn more money. I've transitioned into more of the comprehensive planning side. So I'm actually on the CFP track now, um, this late into my career. So, you know, really can add some insight on, you know, just how to grow a client base, but then transitioning them. So great. 
Great, great. Um, yeah, one thing I think um, all the students listening today will learn is there's many tracks within financial planning and wealth management. Well, I'm sure we'll touch on them all today, but as Sid mentioned, there's an, a very strong insurance track. Um, we also, if you go down this path, um, even in the curriculum here, you'll learn about estate planning. So estate planning is definitely a niche in this in this area. There's tax. If you if you enjoy tax, there's we've had uh, three former students go work kind of in tax analyst roles out of this program. So um, there's a lot of different um, niches you can get into here. Um, so yeah, let's uh, let's start off. I'll open up this as a general question to to the panelists. Uh, please feel free to answer, and you can always uh, kind of work off each other and. Um, follow up. Um, why do students uh, typically collect, uh, select this career field and what drew you to this career field? Uh, I'll jump in with, with a less obvious answer. So I would say jobs. I mean, I, I was down at Texas Tech last week. Texas Tech has a huge program and everybody graduating from that program will have a, a job offer, right? And so I think Dina Katz, who runs our program, has some sort of saying that it's like, you, you're going to leave this program with a degree in your right hand and three job offers in your left hand. And so it was the, I graduated in 2009 and just a horrible economic environment. It was the only job I got. So it wasn't so much me selecting it. It was it selecting me because there are jobs. Um, for, so go ahead, go ahead, Sarah. Oh, thanks, Sid. I, I was going to say for me, you know, it's the connection of money and people and how you can see the difference in their lives. So this is really a profession of helping people. You know, last year during the pandemic, it was like, you know, all of the um, essential employees. I'm like, what about us financial planners? I mean, joking, but really in our clients' lives, we are like an essential um, you know, person to them, like they will share more with their financial planner than they may share with their parents, sometimes a spouse, their pastor, their children. And so the trusted role that you can have in someone's life and the way you can impact their life to me is it's really profound. And so um, helping people aligning their wealth, their resources with their goals and being on that um, journey alongside clients is what I love about this profession, and it's what really drew me to to want to be a financial planner. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think one thing that we really try to communicate to the students here um, is that you know this is not all just numbers, right? Finance is a part of it, uh, but you are one part, you know, finance and one part, you know, therapist, or mm -hmm. you know, in a lot of these roles within financial planning, you are. You really have to understand the human side of things and, and manage emotions and, and, and a lot of other um, um, interpersonal issues. Um, Sid, I thought you had a follow up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, we hear this a lot, I, I guess, when we're trying to recruit and, and hire new advisors, everyone says that they're a people person. Right. And so I, uh, I did get into it because I do enjoy talking to people from different walks of life and um, and every day is completely different. So I had internships where um, in financial services and outside of financial services and, you know, just kind of the financial services internships, just I was able to see kind of to Sarah's point how you're impacting people's lives, but also, um, you know, every day was completely different than the day before. So great. I was just going to go off of what Sid said. I think it's it's very much the flexibility in, in the day. I mean, you can go to different firms and every single firm is going to, the way that they do planning is going to be different. The, the kind of clients you can work with are going to be different. It's very variable. So if one firm isn't the best fit for you, there's a lot of different ways out there. You don't have to switch industries. You're able to go to a different firm. You can get a different feel for things. Uh, for me, I wasn't necessarily understanding of what financial planning was when I came into college. I actually came in as an accounting major. Um, I was just doing general business and I thought, you know, I'm, I'm decent with numbers. I think this is something maybe I could do. Um, accounting wasn't for me very quickly on. I realized it was a little bit too structured in a way, but that was the best part about going to a college where there was a program available there. 
Um, I had some friends who were in the program and they said, you know, you should check this out. We have some professors that are going to be speaking on it um, for Derek clock is somebody who, if anyone knows the Virginia tech program, he speaks a lot and is able to kind of get with uh, introductory finance students to talk about this stuff. And he really showed the people side of it, the ability to kind of work through certain problems that people are having financially. Um, it was really intriguing to me. And so that's something where there's a lot of variability in it. And I think it's, it's a great opportunity to look at because there's so much flexibility within. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, very good comments all around. Um, so what, um, kind of going back to the academic side, um, what do you wish you kind of picked up in college um, classes or otherwise that would have um, helped you in this profession? If you had to go back to college, um, <clears throat> what would you have focused on or what kind of skill set would you have worked on? Um, I would I would say I wish I had that financial planning major back when I was in college, um, um, which is great because now kind of going through that CFP track, uh, you know, being a lot older, it's, uh, you know, I wish I had gotten it out of the way a lot younger. So that's some advice that I would give folks. But I would say that um, in terms of classes, you know, the communication classes, I think the classes where you're actually presenting in front of people, talking to people, working with groups, um, it's, it's really important because you can be the smartest person in your class, but if you don't know how to talk to people, then, you know, you're not going to really be able to grow the client base. So. Very good. Um, to, to follow up on that, interestingly enough, um, we have, um, that's what one thing we're actually building out. Um, as um, Andrew mentioned, Virginia Tech has a very good financial planning wealth management um, program. Same, same, obviously with Texas Techs and, and others. Um, and we have mimicked our program here a lot on what they do, <clears throat> including they have um, some very good customer relationship management courses, which we'll be rolling out if you if you are a student here and, and you are in your sophomore year or junior year, we'll be ro rolling out some customer relationship management courses, which really focus on the skills that um, Sid just mentioned. Yeah, I was just going to add to that and I was going to say, um, if this is something you want to do, the track is incredible. It provides that broad exposure. So um, I know, you know our intern, Clay, he uh, talked about a lot about the program. So I know it's very similar to Virginia Tech's. And looking at the classes, you're going to get a wide variety. You're going to get estate planning. You're going to get retirement investments. Uh, you're going to get tax exposure. And then um, I know you guys even have things like ESG investing, certain things like that. So it's very interesting to get that broad exposure to a lot of topics that are very relevant for clients. So just having something like that is great for this. And then as far as if you want to do some sort of extra work or some sort of minor, anything you know, psychology related is great, really helpful for clients. And then something I did was actually entrepreneurship. Um, a lot of people say you can't really teach entrepreneurship. Um, it's kind of your own mindset, which makes sense in a way. But for me, for something where I maybe wanted to start my own practice one day and I wanted to understand kind of the variabilities of, of that management side of it, I think that can be very helpful as well. Thank you. Very good. Uh, <clears throat> so kind of, kind of um, pretty similar question, but um, what other skills along your kind of life path did you did you pick up that really helped in this profession? I think a, a big skill, I think the communication that Sid mentioned in the last question is huge. It's it's being able to communicate effectively to to many different levels of understanding and finances. So the way that you might speak to a business owner might be quite different than a widow. You know, who just lost their spouse with the same, you know, the same message, it looks quite different. But on the flip side, I think another skill is learning to listen. So listening well, understanding their story, because everyone is different. We all have a relationship with money that's unique. And so being able to listen well, um, a lot of times, I think seven out of 10 reasons why um, clients change advisors is, is somehow related to communication, not returning phone calls, not you know, getting emails back, not listening, you know, speaking in a different language, so to speak. Um, and so I think listening well and being able to communicate effectively is really, really important in this profession. Nice. Derek, I just want to add something. Sarah, can I hit the nail on the head? I mean, it's, 
you got to listen. I mean, you can't, it's like the 70, 30 rule, like you 70% of the time you should be listening. Like the client should be the one talking. Um, so you really kind of connect with them and really understand what kind of keeps them up at night. So I think that that's a great point, Sarah. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, that, there was actually, so there was a study on that where they, they listened or they recorded financial advisor meetings. And what they found is that 51 seconds for, for every minute, the advisor was talking and it's kind of the opposite. You know, it's a huge way to differentiate yourself is if you just reverse that, right? We all hear the, the two ears, one mouth thing. Um, there, there's a book, I think it's called Never Split the Difference. It's a negotiation book um, from a crisis negotiator from the FBI. And he, he talks a lot about this, just empathy is the biggest thing, is being able to put yourself in someone's shoes to understand what they're trying to accomplish. And the only way to do that is, is to listen. So just mirroring or mimicking or, you know, everything you guys have, have just said. Very nice. Thank you. That was a great answer. And a uh, book I haven't heard of, but that sounds very interesting. Um, let's see. Um, so we kind of touched on niches within this field. Um, everyone here has kind of a slightly different focus. Um, is there any particular area within financial planning or wealth management that's really excited you recently, or you know, you just want to communicate to the to the student group here that might be a, a, a worth looking at as they as they enter this field? Yeah, I, I know. I I just spoke. Sorry, I'm I'm talking too much, even though I was just talking about listening. <laughs> the um, if, if I were new to this profession, I would not join a firm that doesn't have a niche. And I, I say that all the time. And and the bigger firms like like Mason, you know, there, there are sub niches oftentimes in, in in firms like that. We only work with clients over 55. That's our thing. So we're not in the accumulation phase. We're in the distribution phase. And, you know, that's a that's a big group of people, but it still is enough of a differentiator from a business development perspective the firms you see with explosive growth all have some sort of niche or niches within bigger firms. So I would definitely, as you, as you look at firms, be, that's how you differentiate yourself. So. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like for, you know, for me, I I've, you know, the things about the firms that I've been with Northwestern mutual for 13 years, um, they really taught me a lot how to acquire clients. I mean, go out there and client acquisition is their biggest focus. And so my niche was, you know, of that on the insurance side of things, um, you know, in my natural market, who can I make an impact with the most? And I found that I, I mean, I just have a lot of physicians and dentists and they just know that they need to protect their income with something called disability insurance. And so that was kind of my in. And now that they're paying down their massive student loans and, you know, starting to save more money. That's why I'm transitioning into the wealth management side of things. So that was kind of my niche going into it. Very I think Sorry, go ahead. another, um, another spin instead of a niche is you could think about an ideal client profile. And so I would encourage any of you students that are looking at financial planning or wanting to go into wealth management, write down what are your interests? What excites you? What do you enjoy? What type of people do you like being around? And then you can build out an ideal client profile and kind of have a lot more synergy in your client relationships. So the Mason companies um, where I work currently, um, we have a, a, a strong niche around corporate executives working with you know, major corporations, an entire executive team, and the relationship for financial planning is with the corporation um, that's you know supplementing for for those executives. And um, personally, I have really enjoyed working with women, widows, divorcees, you know, single women that maybe are a little more fearful about money matters. Um, and so, it's trying to simplify and create peace of mind and transferring that um, in, into a learning process is what I've focused on. I don't think serving women is so much of a niche, but it's it's an area of interest and it's a big part of kind of what I had defined as like an ideal client profile. Mm -hmm. And I think that firms are open to new ideas and advisors coming in. So if you have a niche or something exciting, professional athletes, 
you know, I mean, there's lots of different groups. And I think that um, I, it's, it's a great time to be exploring and thinking about what would be your niche or what type of clients would you want to work about, you know, work with even, you know, while you're going through this program. Thank you. Uh, great, great answers all around. Um, <clears throat> so we kind of um, brushed over this, but I wanted to go back to this just because it really paints a picture for students on kind of what paths they can take. Um, do you mind each individual just kind of, I know, I know Andrew's just fresh out of college, but for the people that have, you know, had a 10, 15 year career already, do you mind talking just a, a brief bit about your entry level position and then kind of the path that you took? Just to kind of highlight, you know, the students, this is one p potential way to go. Um, sure, I can I, I can start because I, I actually got my internship with Northwestern um, through Mason um, in my senior year. And so, you know, I didn't come right out of the gates and, and start my own practice. I was working as part of a larger, larger team for a long time. And so you know, I really got to learn the ins and outs of the business, both on the insurance side and actually on the wealth management side of things. Um, and then as I started to um, bring in more business myself from my natural market, I realized that I needed to do this on my own and I was ready to do it on my own. So I think learning from a team early on is, um, is also, a, it's a helpful strategy. I, uh, I started my career at Vanguard, uh, which I think is an excellent place to start mutual funds. I was working in the retirement center. So I graduated college, went to Vanguard, right away started my CFP there through the American College. And I was, you know, in a call center answering retirement questions, and I kept getting return calls. And my manager was like, you know, this is outbound, you can't keep talking to the same people. And I thought, well, I really wanted to like keep talking to the same people. <laughs> and, um, and so then I looked for a job where I could do that. And so I moved to an RIA, Registered Investment Advisor in Charlotte, and then subsequently uh, to the DC area. So 15 years, the last 15 years, I've worked for large RIA firms, you know, working with high net worth individuals and families. But yeah, Vanguard, it was a great start, learned a lot and um, have continued to learn along the way. Yeah, I started, um, I may have mentioned, I started ING. So in 2009, came out of University of Delaware, moved up to Philadelphia, and I had a, a college roommate who spent every summer working at different financial planning firms. And he took a job with ING. And I asked him, I said, why'd you pick ING over all these other companies? And he said, well, they're in a high rise in Philadelphia and they pay more than everybody else. I was like, all right, perfect. Can I do that? <laughs> and so it was, it was really so unintentional. And I think it can be that way. It doesn't need to be, hey, I, you know, I've, I've worked my whole life to get into financial planning. I don't know if anyone actually thinks that way. But you can do anything in this profession that aligns with your skill set. There are jobs for the numbers people. There are jobs for the people people. There, there are jobs for everybody. Anyway, I spent six years there. ING wanted to open a branch down here, so they moved me to Tyson's Corner. Uh, in 2014, ING spun off in the U.S. That was part of their, um, the, they didn't take TARP money in 2009, but they took money from the European Union. They had to spin off their foreign divisions. And so you lost what was a really good brand in, in ING, and that became Voya, not that Voya is a bad brand. But at that point, that's when I switched over to the RIA side. I uh, came to Campbell Wealth Management six years ago. And so day to day now, I run the new business. So I'm a CFP, I'm an enrolled agent, but I do new business for this firm. I guess I can speak a little bit to what the path is typically now. So I don't have a ton of experience, obviously. I've been out a year. And so I started out in a traditional role that you might get out of college today. So a financial planning associate role. Um, and just recently was um, started to work with my own clients. So now I've kind of got the financial advisor title, but I think it really depends on where you're coming from in your college experience. So if you're just a, a general finance major, maybe you didn't go through the traditional path and you want to get in the industry, there's typically a um, client service associate role. So that's where maybe you're doing a little bit more paperwork and more administrative things. So you're getting that entry level experience, kind of seeing 
um, from a different perspective, what an advisor might go through. So you're doing a lot of scheduling, a lot of phone calls in that sense. If you did go through the program, a lot of firms will call it differently. So for me, it was financial planning associate. Some call it paraplanner. Some call it um, associate advisor. But essentially, you're doing a lot more of the heavy lifting when it comes to the financial planning. So I do a lot of the plans myself where I'm actually doing the strategies for the plans. I'm entering a lot of data. And then I'm sitting in and taking a lot of notes on meetings. So that's a big way to gain a lot of experience. So it's kind of building your, your acumen up in a sense and kind of understanding how an advisor will kind of handle the different strategies on how they want to deal with different client situations. And then eventually you would hope that at some point, if you want to be client facing, you could start to get your own clients that way. Or if maybe you're more interested in investments, you could take more of a, a back role and you could look at, you know, do you want to do strategies for investments, do a lot of the tax planning? It just depends on what kind of path you want to take. Yeah, very good points all around by Andrew, Evan, uh, Sarah, and Sid. You really will get into this profession. And I think the way a lot of RAs work right now, and, and even some broker dealers is, you, you, you learn the ropes and then you kind of figure out your niche over time. So for, for those who are listening, you know, you could be client facing, um, you know, within five years or I'm not exactly sure on the time frame, but uh, if you are a very good people person, you know, you can start really managing money. Or if you're a numbers person, you can do back office stuff. You can become a tax expert. Um, you can become an estate planner, um, which is also client facing, but um, you could become a CFA. Um, so CFA, um, a little bit different from a CFP, it more focused on the numbers. Um, but I do know people who work in um, RIAs that are CFAs, who are kind of constructing the portfolios behind the scenes. So there's a lot of different paths you can take, or you, can, you know, obviously the insurance side, um, another one, there's lots of different ways. Um, and we threw around a few terms here. And I know we have a lot of undergrads here on the call. Um, so um, RIA stands for Registered Investment Advisor, um, and typically, um, at least here in the DC area, they're they're slightly smaller groups, maybe sometimes as small as two. And correct me if I'm wrong, maybe maybe they go up to fifteen or twenty person groups. Um, so they're the, the smaller side of, of wealth management, um, um, you know. And then you have broker dealers, or, which are the very large groups, um, your traditional banks that are um, of very large in size. So just to explain uh, what we were talking about there. Um, great, very good, uh, good answers there. Um, let's see. Um, what do you, I think we touched on this again, but might as well go, oh, actually we have a few questions in chat. So let me, um, question from a student. Uh, what are some books, blogs, podcasts that you routinely read or listen to that have supported you throughout your career? So I, I think it totally depends what side of the business you want to be on. Um, I, I mentioned previously, I do a lot of, a lot of business development. And so when I came in, the book they made everybody read was How to Master the Art of Selling which that's not going to help you from a financial planning perspective at all, but it's kind of the, the, the quintessential sales book. There's, um, and I'm going to, you're going to see that my focus is on business development, but to sell is human by Daniel Pink is a good one. Um, story selling for financial advisors by Mitch, Mitch Anthony. is another one I recommend. And then two, two podcasts. So Michael Kitsis, probably very few people on this line know who he is, except for the, the panelists, but he's kind of like the Michael Jordan of this industry. He runs a great podcast, comes out weekly, um, where he's interviewing typically financial advisors. So that's super helpful. And then there's one called The Human Side of Money, which is Brendan Fraser, another podcast, which is entirely focused on, as it says, the, the human side, the non- financial non-number side. Um, I think those are all those are all fantastic. Um, and I would just add that I, I read a lot of um, Nick Murray books and there's one in particular called The Game of Numbers. So it's professional prospecting for financial advisors. So um, that's one that I'll add. So Nick Murray. 
Yep. And I'll say um, Michael Pitts this is fantastic. He has a blog as well. So if you look at that, um, it's very high level, but it's something that's uh, really interesting, gets your mind kind of going on different strategies. Um, as far as podcasts, there's this one called Biff Podcast. Um, it's run by some people from uh, Boston University, uh, and they're associated with Brett Danko, who I use for the CFP. Um, they've got a fantastic podcast talking a lot about a lot of different things. And then one thing I look at, and I'm not sure if uh, George Mason has this. I know Virginia Tech um, pushes this a lot. It's called The Morning Brew. Mm -hmm. So it's an email you get every morning, and it's um, basically just all the finance um, information that's going on in the world right now, and it has links to articles. So it's something really interesting to take a look at. It keeps me up to date on everything going on. Yeah, very oh. Oh, sorry. I'll just add one one more book, uh, The Psychology of Money. If anyone has read that, fantastic uh, for your own personal financial planning, but also with clients. But that's a fantastic list from, from the group. Yeah, very good. <clears throat> very good recommendations all around. Um, Michael Kitsis is right in our area. Um, I think he lives in Fairfax or no, um, I can't remember. He, he lives right in Northern Virginia. So we're, we're trying to constantly get him in, but he's a very busy man. Um, I, <clears throat> his website is kitces.com, kitces, K-I-T-C-E-S. He is, as they mentioned, as the, everybody on the panel mentioned, he's kind of like the Michael Jordan of financial plan. So please do check out his, his website. Um, very good comments all around. And to echo Andrew's sentiment about keeping up to date on current events, uh, morning brew, or, you know, I always echo uh, the Wall Street Journal, like just understanding what current events are. I always make my students read the Wall Street Journal. So yeah, and anything that keeps you up to date on what's happening in financial markets. <clears throat> um, let's see, we got, we got a bunch of students questions coming in. Um, what aspects of financial planning has a positive impact on your life? Yeah, no, I, I don't want to jump in right away, but um, the what aspects of financial planning or the career um, have a positive impact in my life? I think I think they mean the career. Yeah, the career. Yeah, I'd say um, you know some of the things that we talked about before. Um, you know, just listening, I think, has has kind of helped in other areas of my life outside of this career. But then also um, just, you know, in, in terms of this career, just like never passing judgment, like when you do talk to someone. I think that's that's a big thing that I've I've kind of learned over the course of my career is that everyone has a different problem. They're, you know, struggling with different things and to really not pass judgment and, you know, kind of not look in the rearview mirror, but look ahead has been kind of always helpful. Thank you. Uh, great. Uh, we'll go on to the next student question. Uh, do you re recommend that students uh, take behavioral finance courses um, in college? If available, 100%. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Very good. Short and succinct. <laughs> so Jinx. definitely definitely take that one and, and again just to plug our own program um we don't have a behavioral finance course you you will learn it in finance 311 uh, but keep on the lookout for that client relationship management course that uh hopefully will be launching in six months or a year um it'll be a really interesting one where you're 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 doing a lot of role playing with a client um and you know uh you know, running through different scenarios of what their needs are and how do you manage it. So I think it'll be an interesting course. So keep it, I'll be, I'll be plugging that along the way. So, okay. Um, is a CPA required or recommended to be a financial advisor, wealth manager? Question from a student. Is, is anybody on here? here? Sorry, Sarah, go ahead. I was going to say, I think it makes you more marketable if you have both a CFP and a CPA, because I know my firm does tax. And so I, I do review tax returns and I don't have a CPA. Um, but if you have that tax background, I think that you can move, you can perhaps move forward faster 
in the early parts of your career, you have both. And, and also I would say, if don't just get the CPA to be more marketable. If you enjoy tax and you wanted to lean in that part of the business, absolutely get the CPA. If you hate tax, then you know, don't get the CPA. So have the motivation be where you want to go with your career, but having both, I think a lot of firms uh, really like that. Yeah, I would say if you already are getting the CPA, it's a very natural transition to come into the profession. And I would go that way, but I would not go CFP to CPA hmm. because they say, you're, you're going to have to go do all of these things that are, you know, you're going to have, I, I think there's an audit requirement, experience requirement for audit with the CPA, things that just are so unrelated to our business. You can do tax returns, you can prepare returns, represent taxpayers within World Agent, um, which will be much more related to the day-to-day -day of, of what we do as financial planners. So CFP is like the, the thing you should absolutely get if you want to be in this profession. CPA, CFA, as Sarah said, make you more marketable, but are huge endeavors that make sense if that's going to be your core focus. Yeah, very good point on that. Yes, yeah. um, CPA, again, as, as Evan mentioned, uh, it's probably very difficult to go the CFP path and then shift to a CPA path. That's, if you do it the other way, it's doable. And uh, the CFA as well is a three-year, you know, three-part test. So it is a considerable amount of time. Um, good, good. I was gonna mention one other thing. Okay, another, another student question. Um, there are licenses, certifications, such as the series six and series seven. Are these needed to be financial planners? When is it appropriate to work toward those, um, i.e. in what type of industry within financial planning? So totally depends on your path, once again. So the, the series licenses, the 7, 6, 63 are all brokerage licenses. So if you're going to work for a broker dealer, you, you need those things. Um, but the, the registered investment advisor, which folks had mentioned on here previously, that's a series 65 license. It, it doesn't take as long to get a series 65 as a series seven. I, I would not take any of those until you have a sense of, of where you're going. And I, I took them a decade ago, so I don't know what the rules are now, but the way it used to work is you'd have to have a company sponsor you before you took them. And so you may not even be able to do them. The, once again, the most relevant thing, the most important thing for us when we recruit is that people have the CFP or they're on the CFP track. The, the licensing exams are a thing we have people go and get after the fact. Very good. Um, yeah, so, so everyone who's listening, the, the new degree that we've opened up here, the Financial Planning Wealth Management uh, degree here at Mason is CFP certified. And to go back to the previous question about um, kind of accounting, there is significant overlap between our accounting degree in financial planning, also our finance degree in, in financial planning. So we do have a number of people that are double majoring, right? Because you can kind of knock one out and, and do a few extra classes to get the other. Um, and, you know, if you have the time, this is one strategy to take uh, just in case if you are still uncertain about what you want to do coming out of college, um, having a, a double major where one isn't too much extra work. Um, we have a question on our uh, actually about our new, our other new degree here. We have a new degree uh, within the school of business called data analytics. Um, and the question is, would a data analytics degree be helpful within the uh, financial planning or wealth management industry? Can you share a little bit more about what the data analytics degree is? Sure. I, I think it's um it's how do you manage databases? Um, you know, I'm not too familiar with it, but I'm, I'm guessing it has to do with like, you know, maybe a little bit of coding like SQL and, and Python and um, you know, um, how do you do data analysis uh, using R and other stats packages? Is my guess. Yeah. Well, I I would say one thing. You know, with 
COVID and the transition, we are becoming much more of a virtual profession and that we're doing a lot of things just like this on Zoom. So I think wealth management firms are leveraging technology more than ever before. And we are, you know, Mason, Mason as in my firm, the Mason companies, we're over 70 staff uh, based in Reston, but nationally we have advisors in Chicago, in California, we have folks in Indianapolis and in Florida. And so using technology and having a really, a great tech team uh, is really important. So I know that there are like operations divisions, there's technology, there's marketing, you know, um, there's lots of other groups. So I don't know if it's specifically within financial planning, but for a wealth management firm, I imagine that that um, would be a great track. Right. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll follow up on kind of a more present day question. Um, what in the day-to-day -day life has changed um, with uh, within the last year and a half given COVID? Has your, is there a particular skill set or thing that you, you know, kind of the profession has changed toward that you would, you know, just wanted to um, shed light on? Uh, yeah, <laughs> so for for me, we, my firm, we did almost all of our business development through events. So we, in 2019, we did 100 events, typically classes that I'm teaching or public speaking events. And so we pivoted in March of, 2020 to webinars. We did 135 webinars last year, which I wouldn't recommend. <laughs> it, I mean, it's what we had to do to, to hit our goals. And, and I, I guess my, my takeaway, once again, on the business development side is diversification is key, you know, being able to pivot like that. We were able to do it, but it, it took us a few months. And then the other thing I would say, is that it's made our, our reach much greater. So we, we ran a few virtual events in, in Nashville the other day, just, just because we can. And so it, it's the first time in the existence of this firm that we've been marketing to markets, to people that have no ties to the DC region. So, you know, we've always had the capability of doing that, but I think the demographic we worked with, whether we just thought this or whether it was the case has been uncomfortable with it and now you've got baby boomers who zoom with their grandkids and you know it's it has opened up the the whole country to 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 be able to, to market to everybody once again a marketing focus yeah i i just think you know that's a good point it makes about reach um you know i work primarily with clients in the dc area but since covid now i mean i've clients in like 16 different states. So now with Zoom, it makes it a lot easier to be able to do that. Um, you know, I'm not sitting in traffic every day on 66 as well. And, uh, you know, I wear a lot more shorts and golf polos than suits. So I'd say that's that's a big change as well too. But I would say the reach is probably the most, most important thing. Uh, very good, very good. Um, let's see, let's see, I'm not seeing, I thought we had one more student question. I'll jump back to the, to the main questions. Um, do you have one piece of advice for students that you wish you knew when you were in college, if you can go back in time? I, I give this advice a lot, but it, I wouldn't, if you're going to come into this profession, I wouldn't spend a ton of time trying to find the the perfect role what i would do is i would find that the perfect firm is the wrong word but i would find the the people that that you align with most and that the your first job is not going to be your last job and your first firm is likely not going to be your last firm but you'll be much better off finding people who have the same values as you um firms that have the same values as you and then kind of carving out your role or moving along their career path depending on the firm than trying to find the the perfect thing right up front because there's regardless of which path you take there's going to be grunt work whether it's you know as andrew experienced doing paperwork and and taking notes or it's you know ma making kind of the old world making phone calls to try and get new clients whatever it is your, perf your first job won't be perfect. Just try and surround yourself with the right people. 
Yeah, that's a phenomenal point on culture. Um, that's the number one thing I hear from students who go out and interview. They, you know, they they find very similar RIAs, uh, but that you know, culture can be very different across groups that are the same size and the same location, same niche. Uh, culture and being happy in your in your in your first job, even though it may not be perfect, but finding that correct culture match, I think, is a good thing to consider when you're when you're going out there and interviewing for these positions. Um, and for everybody that um, that is listening, um, we have the the FPA career fair. Um, please email me about this. But if you are interested in a position, the FPA career fair is you, you do have to sign up for it. Um, it is, I believe, October 28th. I think it's some, maybe it's October 20th. I'll have to look on that, but it's coming up in October. If you are interested in a position, this is the main place where um, recruiters are and RAs, broker dealers are hiring. So please. Yeah, October 15th, Friday, October 15th. October 15th. So we got, well, one month. Um, uh, please email me about that if you're, if you're curious, um, but I would highly recommend if you're looking for a position, do, do attend that. Um, good, good, good. Let's see. Um, what obligation does your work put on you outside of the work week? Or what, what, would, what would be a typical work week um, for you? Are you working 60 hours or are you, you having a nine to five or is it a, you know, a 90 hour work week? Um, I'd say for me, it's, um, I mean, it's definitely more than a 40 hour work week. Um, you know, my wife and I don't have kids yet, so I can do like meetings in the evening. I have clients in California. So for example, this evening, I would call it 8 PM because it's 5 PM there. And so right now I can afford to do those things. Um, but I know that once kids are in the picture, it becomes a little bit harder, but I'd say, um, it's definitely not just your 40 hour work week, especially when you're in the phase of trying to grow your practice, you got to put in a lot of time, um, um, just kind of outside just the normal business hours. From an entry level standpoint, I would say business hours are going to be more standard. So um, for me, our business hours are eight to five. So with an hour lunch break in there. So I'm working it depends on the day most days maybe an hour over max um just because there's some things i need to get done but it's not crazy i mean you're talking 40 to 45 hours um as you become an advisor more i, I think it's going to depend on your workload within your firm and then also whatever restrictions you want to place around your schedule so some people are more flexible and say if you know if I have a client that wants to do this. Uh, we can meet at this time. Some are very strict to say, no, like these are my hours and we work around it from that perspective. So it's really going to depend on what kind of schedule that you want to set for yourself moving forward. I would, I would say, you know, I love this profession because there's a lot of flexibility, at least in my role today. Um, but I'm available, you know, 24 seven, uh, essentially to clients because there, there's a demand there when you work with a certain level of wealth, I think that they want to be able to reach out or text or call after hours. Um, I spent several mornings this summer on the side of the swimming pool while my son was at swim team with my computer open and that was working. So that's the other really nice thing that's created more um, opportunity since COVID is working remote and working. Yeah, I mean, I was also selling my house. I was in my car with a hotspot, you know, working, you know, having to get out. And so I think that um, flexibility is something that you can find in this profession, but being available and sometimes clients do need you. I mean, it, you know, I may, may take a call late at night and, you know, it's a, a spouse passed away and you're working through things. I mean, there's, there's events that happen in clients' lives that do demand time, but then you can, you know, do and, and manage your schedule, you know, during the day where maybe you're not working the whole day. So I love, especially as a mom, the, the flexibility of my firm and of, um, of financial planning. Yeah, I'll kind of echo that. There, there's obviously depending on your role and, and your position within the firm, people don't really care, at least the firms I've been at, when you do the work outside of you know scheduled internal meetings, just that it gets done. We have very different approaches to this. You know, as Sarah said, we have people, and I fall into this boat, who 
you know, they'll respond to you. They'll respond to clients, they'll respond to emails. But then we have people who, who protect their schedule, who, who work nine to five, and that's totally fine too. It's just, you know, it's whatever role you have and, and whatever expectations you put out there. And, and I'll add to what Sid said, I, I spent, you know, a decade doing meetings kind of whenever clients wanted to, but I, I take my, la I have a three-year-old, I take my last meeting at four o'clock every day. I, and I, I take my first meeting at nine. So I'm not very flexible there and you can, you can do that. Uh, thank you. That was very informative. Um, last question. I think then we'll, um, for those who have time, uh, we'll do some breakout sessions for maybe 15 minutes where people can ask individual questions. Um, we obviously touched on how COVID has changed the na nature of work in this profession. Are there any trends that you're seeing, long-term trends that are kind of coming up now that students should be aware of either because they can get into that niche or it's a skill set they should should focus on. So kind of is there any long term trends that you've seen kind of starting to form that you would um, like to um, kind of bring to people's attention? I think one is remote work. I was just chatting with um, Ali, who's also on the call, a colleague of mine. And we're talking about, you know, how is this going to change in the future? You know, our new FPA is coming in, going to be in the office five days a week and nine to five, or do they get flexibility? So I think most firms are trying to juggle with, you know, if someone interviews and applies from Boston, you know, do we consider them for a job when it's based in Virginia? Um, so this whole open architecture of where you work and how you work and what that looks like. I've, I've had friends, and I know Allie has as well, that have um, left jobs because they were forced to go back in the office five days a week. And so there's a lot of spectrum and ideas on this. And so it'll be interesting to see for this next generation and for the students here as they're entering into the workforce, what does it look like? What do they want? And I, I'll be curious to know that too, you know, in the office five days a week, fully remote, you know, some hybrid combination. I think that's something that firms are really um, working through and trying to protect the integrity of culture but be flexible and adapt to kind of this changing times. That's a big one, I think. Yeah, I would say you're much more in the driver's seat now as a candidate coming in to say, here's, here's how I'd like to work and where I'd like to work. And we don't have anybody who is required to be here five days a week anymore. And a year and a half ago, everybody was here five days a week. So it's it's just been turned on its head. Um, add to that, I think technology has done a few different things there as well, is that you know, if people are are comfortable working via Zoom, you're you're not competing against the whole country. Right. So yes, you can market to the whole country, but you're also competing against the whole country. And so it goes into having a more specialized focus. It's, you know, if you're going to get your knee replaced, you don't go to your, your primary care physician, you go to the person who's best at replacing knees. And I think that's the future of advice is that people are going to figure out whoever is best at whatever they need, they're going to be able to get it anywhere. Um, and technology supports that from just a you know meeting standpoint, a Zoom standpoint, but also technology is becoming a way to outsource a lot of the technical work. So as you come into this profession, focus on the things that can't be outsourced to technology, which is is the human stuff. Yeah, that's a sorry. Go ahead, Andrew. Sorry. I was just going to say, I think in a similar light, but in a slightly different perspective, I think it also changes um, kind of geographical locations that you can look to and target as well. I mean, just from a standpoint of like what you're taught in school, school, school. from planning, um, you think of the three big areas as San Francisco, D.C. and New York. It's like that's where the wealth is. Like if you want to be an advisor, I mean, you can become an advisor anywhere. There's always a place for it. But those are the areas where people say there's the most concentrated wealth. If you're talking about now with well, people moving out because areas are so expensive and you have the ability to work remotely and you can move to different areas, your clientele is more diverse in different places now. So if you're from more of a geographical location, um, I always use Charlotte as an example. 
um, just because I have a lot of people from Virginia Tech that are going down there. Um, there's a lot of new financial planning firms that are down there. And it's very interesting because at one point it's, it's very bank centric. So you're dealing with um, a lot of your employees or not employees, sorry, your clients are going to be very uh, bank centric. Now they're building data centers down there. There's a lot more um, coding clients. Um, people are diversifying on different um, industries. So it's very interesting from that perspective. So there's a lot more opportunities. Great. Um, phenomenal points. Um, well, that comes right to the top of the hour. Um, so I think we have um, one or two advisors that are that are sticking around and can answer individual questions. Um, but I wanted to thank our panelists, um, Sarah Baker, Evan Beach, uh, Sid, and Andrew Fincher for a great discussion here. Um, to the students that are listening, if you have individual questions, please hang around. Uh, I just got a note from Caleb in chat saying breakout rooms are now open. Students, you can find breakout rooms using the breakout room button and freely switch from room to room if you have questions or want to connect with our panelists. Um, so I guess that's at the bottom. That's the bottom of your Zoom link. You can you can join a breakout room and, and move between breakout rooms um, with, with our panelists. Um, but again, thank you all for attending and, and thank you to, again, the, the four panelists for, for your time. And um, I hope everyone has a good rest of the day. Please follow up with me about the, the program or um, please hang around and, and chat with our individual panels. Thank you all, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.